Hello, everyone. I'm Jim Garrison, and I want to welcome you to day 177 of Humanity Rising. Humanity Rising is an initiative of Ubiquity University and over 300 partnering organizations from all over the world that have come together during this pandemic. We were formed uh, in the spring of last year and launched in, in May uh, to provide an open space uh, for people worldwide uh, to come together to share their experiences and their perspectives, uh, their solutions, their hopes, their dreams, their visions of how humanity can use the crisis of the pandemic as an opportunity uh, for renewal and a greater alignment uh, with the larger uh, ecological system within which we uh, find ourselves. I want to begin our session uh, with a reflection on Alvin Tuffler's seminal book written in the 1970s called Future Shock. I remember I was a doctoral student at Cambridge University and I read his book and it was the first time that I began to reflect that human reality was changing so radically that the question of whether we were gonna survive indefinitely into the future arrested my attention. Tuffler in the book, Future Shock, said that from time immemorial, generation after generation of human beings, and it's been estimated that there's been about 10,000 generations of human beings uh, in the last 250,000 years or so, since humans have been basically like we are today. For about 250,000 years, uh, people have been as intelligent, as emotionally aware, uh, as physically capable, as strategically astute, as communally and socially oriented as we are today. And over the thousands and thousands of years, we begin to develop slowly, incrementally, a momentum that began to accelerate until about 75 years ago, we reached a threshold that changed the world as we know it. And uh, the best way to, to understand it is just to uh, think through the thought experiment. If you start, you all know what a chessboard looks like eight squares times eight squares, 64 squares. If you start in the lower right, lower left square, <clears throat> and you put one grain of, of rice, and you move to the next square and you double it, and then you double it, and then you double it, and then you double it. By the time you get to that 64th square on the far upper right, you've got almost an infinite number of grains of rice. And that's what's happened to humanity. And what Alvin Toffler observed, he says, we are now by the 1970s moving so fast, accumulating knowledge and accelerating technology at such a speed that quite literally the future is coming into the present for the first time in the human journey. It's no longer the past trundling along and we're in this present that is stretching endlessly before us. It's the case now that we're all experiencing future shock. And that's actually inhibiting our capacity to respond. And he said that the greatest challenge that humanity had, this was back in the 1970s, is how do we change our moral 
awareness and consciousness to keep up with the speed of change. And then something happened with inside that, you know, Moore's law, uh, Gordon Moore that uh, founded AMD, one of the giants, the pioneers of Silicon Valley in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, um, uh, said that technology would double <clears throat> every 18 months. Well, again, <clears throat> back to the chessboard. It doubled and doubled and doubled and doubled and doubled until finally, according to observers in about 2007, 2008, we hit that upper right hand square of the chessboard and human knowledge and technology exploded into hyper complexity at a level and at a pace and at an impact that is assaulting humanity's capacity to respond. And that was the year the iPhone came out. That was the year Facebook that was a turning of exponential speed. Now, with you combine that with the fact that humanity, as it was accelerating, was not uplifting its consciousness, but continuing those trends at the heart of which was the desecration of the environment and climate change and global warming and a range of global crises spinning out of control simultaneously with this explosion of exponential knowledge and technology, such that knowledge of what they say today, in February 2021, is doubling every 12 and a half minutes. and then we get COVID, how are we to understand the chaos that the momentum of our behavior, the acceleration of what we've created is producing in the world at large and the challenge that it confronts us with as we seek as mere mortals basically the same as we were 250,000 years ago in a world that is now spinning literally out of control. In a decade in which scientists are now telling us that this exponential explosion at the center of which is radical increases in climate change and other species extinctions and the decimation of our biodiversity is challenging us in ways that we've never experienced. And we have about 10 years to sort it out, maybe less. So the question that we've been probing in Humanity Rising, as I said at the beginning, how do we use the crisis of the pandemic, the crisis of climate change, the crisis of species extinction, the crisis of overpopulation, the crisis of poverty, of racism, as an opportunity for human renewal. That's the $64,000 question in my mind. Changing consciousness proportional to the challenge. If we can do that, we will be remembered forever as that generation that uplifted our species quarter of a million years in to a level that we ensured the ongoing possibility of being human in a more abundant, sustainable, regenerative, resilient way and ensured unto our children, unto the seventh generation the kind of abundance that all of us know is possible if we would just raise our consciousness. So it's with great pleasure uh, today, in fact, with a sense of feeling privileged that I wanna introduce you to Carolyn Baker. 
uh, who was a, a psychotherapist, psychotherapist for many, many years, uh, 17 years, I believe, and then a professor of psychology uh, for 10 years. She's written 13 books. And I would say of all the authors I know, Carolyn Baker has spent more time contemplating the question that I just posed. If you distill it down, it's how do we navigate through chaos with a purpose of regeneration. In fact, her last uh, book with Andrew Harvey is called Radical Regeneration. We talked about it a few months ago uh, when Carolyn and, and Andrew were uh, with us on Humanity Rising. Uh, and so I asked uh, uh, Carolyn to uh, rejoin us uh, to uh, uh, really speak to us uh, from her heart about how we create islands of sanity uh, in a rising sea of chaos with a view and with an intent of galvanizing the kind of regenerativity in our psyches, souls, and hearts that will enable us uh, to um, move into the future with the kind of abundance we know is possible. So uh, Carolyn, I wanna welcome you back to Humanity Rising uh, and turn the program over to you. Thank you so much, Jim. Uh, what a joy and pleasure to look forward to these sessions. And I love your meditations and your speaking afterward as we, um, as we come together to consider this incredibly relevant and scary and joyful possibility. So, um, what I want to talk about this morning is how we develop islands of sanity in seas of chaos. Last month, the world was relieved to say goodbye and good riddance to Donald Trump as the president of the United States. And while this was a huge advance for humanity and it removed one sea of chaos, many others yet remain climate chaos, a global pandemic, racial injustice, authoritarianism, and economic inequality are still very much with us. We might have removed Trump from the most powerful office in the world, but we're now faced with chaos that didn't begin with him and won't be resolved by new policies. While it's crucial to strengthen our activism around these issues, we need to have specific tools for navigating the chaos of our individual lives and in our communities. We need to marry our activism with grounded spirituality and robust practices that support awakeness, discernment, and that create islands of sanity in an insane world. And actually echoing much of what Jim said is the poet Rumi from the 13th century, many hundreds of years ago, whose words are as relevant to us now as they were then, perhaps even more. As he writes that poem that I'm sure most of you have heard before, The Guest House. This being human, is a guest house, every morning a new arrival, a joy, a depression, a meanness. Some momentary awareness comes as an unexpected visitor. Welcome and entertain them all, even if they are a crowd of sorrows who violently sweep your house empty of its furniture. Still, treat each guest honorably. He may be clearing you out for some new delight. The dark thought, the shame, the malice, meet them at the door laughing and invite them in. Be grateful for whoever comes because each has been sent as a guide from beyond. Essentially, what Jim was telling us is that a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. 
And when we think about the seas of chaos, it's almost impossible not to feel overwhelmed. It's been helpful for me to reframe these and other seas of chaos in terms of a rite of passage or an initiatory ordeal for humanity. A rite of passage is a ceremony existing in all ancient and traditional societies that marks the passage from one developmental, social, or religious status to another. And these rites continue still to, to this day in some places. In ancient cultures, young people were prepared from birth to participate in a rite of passage near the age of puberty, which would mark their transition from childhood to adulthood. And it almost always involved a physical ordeal somewhere in nature, followed by a celebration and a welcoming from the community. Now, there were three essential aspects of the rite of passage that have been identified by scholars of the ritual. The first was a vision of possibility. From birth and through childhood, a young person was prepared for his or her rite of passage. And a key aspect of the preparation, of course, is understanding why they need the right. Why, why do this in the first place? And what it can help them accomplish in their life and for the community. The second aspect was the ordeal, which was a set of physical or emotional challenges that caused them to descend into the psyche and the depths of their humanity to discover transcendent resources that would carry them through the ordeal and cause them to experience firsthand the power of their deeper, authentic self or soul. And finally, there was the homecoming and celebration, which allowed the young person to find their place in the community. The community saw this initiation as a gift to the community. And from that gratitude, you know, enormous celebrations were conducted that may have gone on for days. Now, of course, modern cultures have some rites of passage, such as the quinceanera or the bat or bar mitzvah. But these rituals are residual fragments of formal rites of passage from traditional cultures in which longer, more comprehensive procedures involved not only celebration, but opportunities for the young person to engage in deep introspection and contemplation, particularly in nature. Now, while modern rites of passage or modern cultures no longer have rites of passage, older indigenous and traditional cultures believe that they were necessary. The initiation always involved some type of ordeal that not only required endurance and physical and emotional strength, but also compelled the young person to reach down inside themselves to discover a deeper identity. In other words, the ordeal revealed to them that they're more than a mind or an ego, that they are a spiritual, eternal being. Indigenous cultures are alive and evolving in the 21st century, but many aspects of their cultures have been obscured or even lost by way of their need to be involved in the modern world for the purpose of making a living, getting an education, and the pressure on them that's always been there to assimilate into mainstream culture. At the core of the traditional community's worldview was a deep, an intimate connection with nature. Nature was sacred to them because they saw themselves as part of nature, inextricably connected. And so was the spirit of every living being. The community believed that if the young person didn't have an initiatory nature-based experience, they'd have difficulty connecting with the sacred within themselves and in the world. And without experiencing that there is sacred being, 
they would never really become a mature being. And as a result, they would actually become toxic to the community. So for this reason, the community was willing to risk the possibility that the young person might not physically survive the ordeal. Usually they did survive, but sometimes they didn't. So I just like to reiterate here and summarize uh, and, and give you a, a very important definition and summary of the rite of passage. The purpose of the rite of passage was to compel the initiate to psychologically and spiritually descend into a deeper part of themselves, some would say a sacred or divine core within, that contains not only the wisdom one needs to navigate the rite of passage, but that through the rite of passage will profoundly impact one's awareness and behavior going forward. The rite of passage is a transformational experience that alters one's experience of oneself and the world. It changes the initiate to the extent that he or she discovers a deeper sacred layer of their humanity and in doing so realizes that they will never be quite the same as before the initiation. This experience also motivates the initiate to action or significantly alters actions that they're already taking. Now let's move ahead to the 19th century. Carl Jung reframed the initiation as an experience that modern humans experience on a daily basis in the context of their Western lifestyles. He thought that any form of adversity, maybe a loss of a relationship, loss of a job, a terminal illness, a loss of a child, even, even the smallest losses can be forms of initiation. So the question that we're left with in reframing the myriad seas of crisis and chaos as planetary rites of passage is, how can I be a student of the crisis, of the chaos? What kind of new human being am I being asked to become? And this is what Andrew Harvey and I talk so much about in Radical Regeneration, birthing the new human in the age of extinction, which is our most recent book. What is the process? What's the actual process of navigating the information, the uh, initiation? What tools do we need? That's what I really want to focus on right now. It's important to understand that the process is messy and disorienting. And in the olden times, as initiates went through the ordeal, it was chaotic and often felt to them crazy making. Some parts of the ordeal were very lonely and they may have felt abandoned and isolated in nature. And sometimes elders were there to support them or maybe not too far away. And at other times, the initiate was completely alone. So for us, I think that some specific tools can be useful. One of the first of these is becoming comfortable with emotions because you're going to need your emotional wits about you increasingly as we navigate these many crises. Develop your emotional intelligence, but especially develop your emotional endurance. This doesn't mean that we don't give ourselves a break from our emotions, but that we develop familiarity with them. And one of my favorite books on this topic is Miriam Greenspan's um, Healing Through the Dark Emotions. I want to talk just a little bit about that right now. For example, we're all living with some form of fear as we think about climate chaos or the pandemic. We shouldn't be paralyzed by our fear, but since it's going to be with us for a long time in varying degrees, why not get to know it? 
I know that those of us who live in the Western United States look ahead six months or so, or maybe not even that long, and we think about the many fires that have taken place in the Western United States in the last four or five years, catastrophic fires. I certainly think about it. And sometimes I just sit with it and I, and I feel the fear in my body. And, and then I ask myself, you know, what actually am I afraid of losing? My physical residence and, um, you know, a community that I'm familiar with. And of course, beautiful, beautiful nature. So what does this fear prompt me to do that would actually be helpful? Well, work and prepare with my community as much as possible on many levels. And then personal preparation, insurance forms, you know, having a, an escape route um, and, and a, a bag packed of things that I might need. So I'm not only feeling it in my body, but I'm thinking about the actions I need to take. And then another example is grief and loss, which are and will be ubiquitous in our lives. A question I ask all of us is, are we learning the skill of grieving? For that, I urge you to the work of Francis Weller at franciswellernet and the Good Grief Network at goodgriefnetwork.org. Understand that conscious grief work is a gateway, not only to coping, but to deep joy and meaning. In my experience of doing grief work, with folks in my coaching and spiritual counseling practice and in workshops, I noticed that when people develop the skills of grieving, they're not only better able to cope, but paradoxically, they deepen their, compa their capacity to experience joy and beauty. That's something this culture just doesn't compute. But when you experience deep grief, especially in the support of others, with others, joy and beauty become more accessible. Another tool is understanding that in becoming a student of the chaos, the rational mind and the human ego are being shattered. And that is the direct spiritual purpose of the chaos. We need to notice what any crisis is asking us to let go of. In these many seas of chaos that we're swimming in now, how is who you thought you were giving way to becoming a different person? In many ways in this last year, we've all become different people and I suspect we've had some ego demolition, which is a very good thing. And one of the things that it has taught us is another tool, or I hope it's taught us because it really needs to, and that is becoming comfortable with uncertainty, as in the title of a wonderful book by Pema Children. Instead of asking, when is the earth going to become uninhabitable? When is the human race going to be extinct? When will the pandemic be over? Stop asking those questions. You don't know and neither does anyone else. That's the hallmark of chaos. And if we could be certain, it wouldn't be chaos. Yet another really important emotional and spiritual tool is holding the tension of the opposites in the words of Jung. Become comfortable with paradox. Two seemingly opposite realities can be true at the same time. In mythology and in Jungian psychology, holding the tension of opposites is mythologically and metaphorically like a crucifixion of the soul in which it makes it possible for a third force or third option to arise. 
which reconciles the opposites and opens a way forward. Yet another tool, we hear the expression all the time, find your tribe. And as trite as that may be, we all desperately need allies, particularly in a time when we're physically isolated from each other. The pandemic is keeping us from our, our many in-person meetings, but we now have more choices for online connections than we've even had before the pandemic. Here we are in this moment together, connecting with each other around the world. And I know that many of you on this call are, are, are <clears throat> excuse me, are already allies. But if you're new to this network, use it to expand and deepen your connections. And next, I would urge everyone to work on their trauma. Trauma is a new subject now that is that is rising to um, more recognition as we really begin to recognize the trauma, the level of trauma that we're in. <clears throat> we've all been colonized and we've all been traumatized. And there are many, many online opportunities for doing this kind of work. And related to that, another tool is to notice that working on your trauma cannot be separated from doing shadow work because the shadow is partially born from trauma. But in any event, shadow work is crucial both individually and collectively because the shadow has now erupted and gone berserk on our planet. I urge you to read in more detail about this from my book, Dark Gold, or listen to the audiobook of Dark Gold, which you can find at my website, carolynbaker.net. And then directly related to this is actively working for truth and justice because there cannot be any peace or unity or reconciliation until the truth is told and justice happens. A lot of people right now, especially in the United States, are talking about unity and healing. But unless there's accountability and truth telling, there cannot be any healing. Authoritarianism is increasing worldwide. And in the US, we had a fascist uprising on January 6th, and it will not be the last one. We have fascist sympathizers in our Congress, we have people in our Congress who want to kill other members of Congress. And of course, everyone's saying, well, let's just move on. We have a new administration, let's just move on. But there can be no moving on until truth is told and justice is allocated for these crimes. At the same time, everyone needs a spiritual path that nurtures and challenges them in growing their authentic, sacred self and diminishing the ego. Also, spend as much time as possible in nature. Go into nature as a sacred temple. This is part of our spiritual path. Don't go into nature uh, as, a, as an authority, as a climate scientist, as a biologist, but go in innocently with a childlike beginner's mind and cultivate innocent intimacy with the earth community. And I come now to two of the most important questions that I've been asking folks to consider for 14 years that, as I've been doing this work. And to continue carrying these questions in your heart every day as a practice. Who do I want to be in the seas of chaos? Who do I want to be? And secondly, what did I come here to do? Service 
and activism are our moral responsibility at this time. And focus on, as you ask these questions, creating islands of sanity in a sea of chaos. When, you, when you're in the midst of the chaos, okay, where can I create sanity for myself and for those around me? And I've borrowed this terminology from Margaret Wheatley, who's an American author and management consultant and Buddhist teacher. She writes about it extensively in her latest book, Who Do We Choose to Be? She too is asking that very important question. And this is what she says. While there are very destructive dynamics at play in our civilization, as our civilization travels down the arrow of time, these dynamics do not have to wield the influence on anyone or any group that is willing to open to its environment, use its intelligence, and bravely face reality. Whenever we open rather than close, we become alive. A living system capable of self-organizing into new order rather than succumbing to disorder. The good news is that this is happening in many places, enlivened places, resisting disorder by using their hearts and minds well. And every one of them is grounded in an ethic that places people at the center of all decisions and actions, sanity in action. So, this is the message of Rumi's guest house, and this is the work in front of all of us in the madness of the moment. I thank you all for being here today, and I'd love to take some of your questions. Thank you, Carolyn. Uh, splendid and comprehensive. Uh, and uh, uh, very much to the point of what we all need to uh, consider. Um, I want to encourage uh, all of you to put any questions or comments you, you might have in the chat. But I'd like to um, uh, start, uh, Carolyn, by having you um, go a little deeper into a couple areas that you just highlighted in your main um, uh, uh, remarks, and that is the whole issue of initiation. You know, um, as you pointed out, you know, initiations are critically important for just the mature development of boys and girls as they move into their uh, pubescence, into their uh, adulthood. And normally it's a very conscious process uh, to which they look forward to, uh, they're guided into uh, and assisted so that the tribe or the community ensures a, uh, a happy ending and, and an optimized outcome. What we're in, even though people talk about it as an initiation is something that is messy uh, it doesn't feel like an in initiation. It feels like chaos. We've had very little preparation. Uh, there's no one really guiding us. We're not sure of the next moment. So we're unsure of how things are going to work out. So I'd like you to comment on how at the macro level, how is this really like an initiation when there's very little connections between what we're experiencing collectively in the chaos of our own undoing and the kind of very carefully choreographed um, uh, initiatory processes um, that have been developed uh, over time? Um, just if you say, even think of the bar mitzvah in the Jewish community. I mean, they've been doing that for thousands of years and every 13 year old boy uh, in the Jewish community knows that's what's coming, prepares himself uh, and moves through it. 
but we're not experiencing any of that in our world writ large, and yet people talk about it as if it's some kind of initiation. So explain more deeply how that is. Well, I'd like to say about indigenous initiations, um, and I'm, I'm intellectually familiar with several of them, um, they were not carefully choreographed necessarily. Um, a young person was taken out into nature and it was wild, it was messy, it was terrifying. And they knew this was gonna happen. It's not like they didn't know what they were getting into, but it was horrifying sometimes beyond their imagination. I'll give you a couple of examples. Some of you are familiar with the work of Maladoma Somme and maybe familiar with the work of his um, ex-wife, uh, Sobanfu. And they talk about their initiations in the Daggeret tribe of West Africa. And Maladoma talks about being buried in the earth up to his neck for five days. Now just, just imagine being buried in the earth up to your neck for five days and he said, you can feel the entire earth spinning in your body. And it's incredibly disorienting and terrifying. And the elders are around, oh, do you need some water? Here's some food. But basically, you're on your own. So Banfu describes being hung upside down for a couple of days from a tree as part of her initiation. And yeah, they knew the procedure, but they had no idea the depth and horror of feelings that would come up for them. Mm. It was like a semi-psychotic experience. So that is what I'm talking about in terms of the similarities of, uh, of our situation. And the tragedy of our situation is we have no elders Nobody prepared us for this. No elder is accompanying us in this. We don't have a homecoming celebration to look forward to. Okay, so it perhaps is, is even more terrifying for us. But framing this as a rite of passage uh, with all of the horrible feelings and emotions of the ordeal um, has been useful for me in framing what we're dealing with. Yeah, I, th I think that that begins to make uh, sense. In some ways, we have to, initiation is an interpretive framework, right? It's the way you're analyzing uh, the experience that you're having. Right. You bury somebody in the ground for five days and, and there's no initiation because they're not processing it internally in that way, they're considering it a torture or they're considering it a punishment, uh, etc. So that the challenge for for those of us seeking to be more conscious is to interpret our reality at the moment, yes, as an initiatory process. So, Absolutely. so uh, uh, it's a it's a it's a self induced experience. It's a way of framing it that, um, you know, uh, I, I'm, I'm sure that many of those folks as they were going through their earth-based rites of passage were feeling like they were going to go crazy and were probably raging at the elders and what the hell do I have to go through this for? You know, once I get out of here, I'm never talking to you again, you know, whatever. Uh, and, and so, in that way, there are tremendous similarities, but it helps us to frame it, you know, and that the whole intention is the remaking of our selves and our communities. Yeah, good. Um, a couple of questions that have come up. Uh, one from uh, Dahana Rice. Uh, her question is, what is your personal dark gold? Mm. My personal dark gold is the shadow that I developed in my upbringing that uh, has driven me to do deep work 
on that shadow and find in it the gold that is there. And I can't say it's any one thing. Um, it's a number of things. I grew up in a, you know, a Bible thumping evangelical family in the Midwest of the United States um, as an LGBTQ person and, um, you know, had to really liberate myself from that in, in the 60s when so much else was going on in the culture. And, um, um, you know, there was deep, deep wounding as a result of all that. And, you know, I was privileged to, to do some deep work in Jungian therapy for a number of years um, that has really allowed me to do the work that I'm doing today and be the person I am today. And that work is ongoing. Yeah, say a little bit more about that. That's very uh, interesting because so many people are in the process of questioning uh, some of their deepest identities around gender and sexuality. And, and, and that must have been particularly stark for you. Um, uh, how old were you when you sort of became aware of this inside yourself? Yeah, I guess in puberty, I, I was certainly aware of it. And then I had to really keep it under wraps, of course, to, to be in my family. I was an only child, which made it maybe worse. Um, and, um, you know, even, even as I went to college and, you know, I was kicked out of a Bible college because I was gay. Um, but even as I went on to university um, in the throes of all the cultural changes of the 60s, there was still this lack of permission. There's still this homophobia right. culture wide until the women's movement. And then the women's movement sort of opened everything up to where we could begin exploring these different uh, ways of being in the world. And so, you know, we all are deeply wounded. And, and so in this exploration, it's very important for us, not just to look to the positive of, well, you know, I can be who I wanna be, which is wonderful, but what has my wounding been? Because if the shadow isn't dealt with, then it will erupt in some way in our lives and it will cause us to harm other people as well as ourselves. Yeah, well, that's, uh a very dark golden trauma uh, and shadow content to work on. Thank you so yeah, and much. I, I wrote an entire book on it called Coming Out from Fundamentalist Christianity in 2006. So that's available on my website too, if anybody wants to check it out. Yeah. Well, having had a similar uh, missionary background in the conservative uh, Baptist uh, fundamentalist tradition, wow. um, uh, I uh, have uh, very rich <laughs> uh, dark gold uh, that I'm still working with uh, today. Um, so um, we should get together at some point, uh, Carolyn, and compare notes. <laughs> I think that would be really a good thing. <laughs> and by the way, everyone, just to flag it, this is a very important issue, by the way, the, the transformation that's going on in gender and sexuality and we're uh, convening a course uh, in July, uh, between the 4th and the 10th of July, uh, through our wisdom school um, on how male and female identities are being shape-shifted as the revolution in gender and sexuality takes place all around us. Uh, in the world today, particularly among the young. Uh, it's a very powerful impulse. Uh, but as Carolyn says, it's shrouded in taboos and um, uh, religious and conventional restrictions and shame and guilt. So how all of us work through this is an incredibly important part of our uh, ongoing capacity to love ourselves as ourselves changes and evolves uh, in rather dramatic forms having to do with the very basis of our gender uh, and sexuality. So I uh, thank you for bringing, uh, bringing that up, uh, Carolyn, and 
Uh, it's something that's fascinated me for uh, many years, and we're convening a whole course on it. Great. And as you know, we've had several sessions on these matters uh, uh, during the course of Humanity Rising. We'll be attending to it again. Uh, but let me uh, turn to another question from uh, Una Menges. Uh, she says, hi, Carolyn. My question is, would you agree with me and my colleague, Helena Norberg-Hodge, that to really make progress in what we are seeking to do here together, we need not only to find global community uh, like this, but to help facilitate a relocalization of our world so that we can have more real community. And would you agree, Carolyn, that furthermore, we should not we should put significant resources into creating such real community ourselves. Uh, that is, real communities ultimately have to be physical, not virtual. Would you agree or not? Um, I think that's true. I have, a, I don't know if, uh, if she's referring to intentional communities, but, um, my experience and, and looking at the statistics around intentional communities, um, we know that 98% of them do not endure. And the reason they do not endure is people uh, in Western culture have such a difficult time living and working with each other. And I think that's a place where the shadow that is not being dealt with, uh, you know, it tends to erupt and destroy things from the inside out. Um, but I'm certainly um, supportive of localization, as much localization as possible, and as tight knit in our community interaction as, as we can be, not necessarily living together, but being physically present with each other as the pandemic permits. Yeah, yeah, that would make sense. I mean, one thinks of the, the pseudo community on Facebook. Right. Where they're telling us to, you know, like and di dislike and be friends and form community. And all the while they're commodifying everything that we're doing and selling us off as assets. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, so uh, this question is, is, I think, a really important one. Um, uh, you know, how do we form community? Mm -hmm. You know, Humanity Rising is seeking to, to form virtual community. Mm -hmm. And what's happening is that the larger community is spawning little sub communities like our, our, our chat action group that has now become its own a sort of autonomous uh, entity. And uh, we were launching the masters in regenerative action. So there's a whole subgroup that's beginning to interact. Um, so there's a, it's sort of there's like uh, what we're developing is an ecology of communities, some virtual, some hybrid some physical, um, some local, some regional, some global simultaneously so that our sense of community is being fractalized uh -huh. in, in, in many ways. Is that your experience? Well, I don't have a direct experience with that, but it sounds absolutely wonderful. And, um, you know, and the pandemic is just forcing us to do things in yeah so many different ways that we maybe hadn't even thought of in the past. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, now, going back to this initiatory question for a moment, uh, Charles uh, Benzinger uh, asked a, a, a very specific question. Would love to get your comment. If climate change, COVID, and white supremacy, QAnon, represent the initiation how are we doing with meeting these challenges? How do we turn that into an initiation? Hmm. It's a very interesting question, Charles. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I certainly think with COVID, um, I'll, I'll take that one first. Uh, with COVID, it is a direct initiatory experience, I believe, resulting from climate change. And I am not sure that 
COVID is going to end anytime soon as we see all these variants erupting. I'm also certain that COVID is not the last pandemic because there's a direct connection between climate chaos and pandemics, viruses. Um, so I think that this can be a very long and grueling initiation. Mm. Um, and that's why I sort of chuckle inside when people say, well, when the pandemic is over, I'm going to do X, Y, Z. And, uh, you know, I just, uh, I'm reluctant to, to go along with that. You know, uh, there are wonderful things that we dream of and that we miss being able to do, but don't be so sure that we can do them again anytime soon. And I think we will be profoundly changed by the online connections that we've had during this pandemic time, which may, um, you know, whenever it is down the line that we can connect physically, um, that those online connections will influence us in many ways. So um, COVID is definitely an, initi an initiatory experience. And of course, there's life and death right there, you know. It's, it's an existential crisis, just as climate chaos is. And as far as QAnon, um, boy, there's the eruption of the American shadow. There's a civil war that we never ended, that we swept under the rug, that we never fully healed during the time of reconstruction. And so this is profound shadow work. And you know, I suppose I could write a whole book on how we deal with that in terms of our own shadow and healing that shadow in our culture. Um, it is certainly an initiation that we have to look at ourselves more deeply. How, and that's why the whole, you know, the racial, um, the racial justice piece is so important right now. It's no accident that that has erupted at the same time as the remnants of an unresolved civil war. It's all of a piece. And I think that all of us who are not people of color need to be doing racial justice work mm -hmm. with ourselves and with our communities. Absolutely, absolutely. I'm reading a, a book uh, by Emmanuel uh, Acho called uh, Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man mm. and uh, finding it uh, challenging me in, in very powerful ways. So thank you for, uh, for raising that. Uh, now your, your comment that the, the, you know, we're not gonna be out of the woods uh, when the pandemic's over and we can expect further turbulence and escalation of crises. Um, uh, uh, Dehana Rice is asking, uh, what does your intuition tell you about the thousand years of peace in sacred texts? You know, you think of the book of Revelation, that after the trials and tribulations and the pouring of the different vials of the wrath of God on our poor planet, uh, then uh, the Messiah ushers in a thousand years of peace. Uh, what's your sense of all that? Um, I don't really have a sense now. of it, but I know what you and I were raised on, which is uh, after that thousand years, Jesus is going to come back and destroy the earth. And then all of the Christians will go up to heaven and everybody else is going to, you know, fry in hell. So um, <laughs> that's, that's what I know about the thousand years of peace from the Bible. And uh, that is the justification that white evangelicals use for who gives a shit about the earth, you know, because God's going to destroy it anyway. It's ours to be on and procreate and use and whatever we want to do. And there'll be that thousand years of peace. But then after that, you know, Jesus is going to come back and destroy the earth. Um, not a pretty picture. So I'm not, I'm not familiar with the thousand years of peace in any other way. Yeah, that's the predominant depiction, uh, certainly in the, in the Western Abrahamic 
uh, tradition. Um, but it, it, it has to do with how we view the future and whether we think that, that the dark side, the shadow, evil can be conquered once and for all. Or are we every generation, every individual uh, wrestling with these issues anew? I remember when I was uh, doing my uh, uh, doctoral dissertation, um, a, uh, my mentor uh, said to me uh, once, you know, God has no grandchildren. And what he meant by that is that every single human being that comes into this world has to wrestle in his or her own way with the great issues of morality, ethics, spirituality, belief. And your parents simply can't pass it on to you. They can advise, they can exemplify one, their own particular response. But for some reason, we, 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 we're not part of an evolutionary stream where uh, morality and ethics, justice, love, peace is passed on. It's something that has to be renewed in the soul of every individual. Yeah. What, what's your view of that, uh, that perspective? Well, I totally agree. And it comes down to what does it mean to be human? And what it means to be human is to be vulnerable and um, vulnerable to the potential of being wounded. And that wounding creates a shadow. That's, that's just how it is. And that shadow is either dealt with and made conscious or it isn't made conscious and then it goes about erupting everywhere and harming itself and other people. This is all about what it means to be human. And by the way, I have no interest in transcendence. Transcendence is part of our problem. Say more. Well, you know, uh, Transcendence is a way of getting away from our humanity, a way of getting away from our connection with earth and with nature and with the soul. Um, and, you know, it's given rise to all kinds of new age movements that are, you know, obsessed with the light and terrified of the dark. And until those two are brought together and worked with and integrated uh, through great initiatory experiences within our lives, um, we miss what it means to be human. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, that's, uh, that's very, very true. Well, I know as a parent of two young men now, uh, 28 and 30, uh, you know, from the day they're born, they're their own person. And they insist even when as a father, you wanna tell them, listen, if you do this, I can tell you, they have to do it themselves. They have to, all of us need to experience the world and the anvil of our existence Absolutely. afresh. Yes. And uh, that's the agony and the ecstasy of what it means to be human. So you're absolutely right. Uh, the, uh, uh, it's, it has to do with our basic identity uh, as, uh, as human beings, yes. um, this, this, uh, this uh, existential reality that every human being learns about him or herself in the universe afresh in an absolutely individualized way. It's like the snowflakes. There's no two snowflakes and all the snow that's all fallen on planet earth over the millennia. And there's no two human beings that are the same. It's, it's one of the miracles of existence, actually. Oh, absolutely. And when I say I'm not interested in transcendence, that doesn't mean that transcendence can't help us become more human. But for me, that's the purpose of transcendence, is to take me deeper into the depths of my humanity and that incredible, precious divine within, which is what we write about in Radical Regeneration. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, another question. Um, 
uh, referring back to future shock and just information, knowledge, overload. What is the best approach, uh, in your opinion, uh, to information overload uh, when so many disparate things seem relevant in this increasingly complex world? So many articles, videos, books to be aware of, uh, for example. How do we deal with information overload? Oh, I think we really have to have boundaries around that. Um, I produce a daily news digest, which I've been producing seven days a week for 14 years, unless I'm sick or I'm traveling or whatever. Um, <clears throat> and I'm, I'm always gathering information, but I have to have boundaries around it um, because the overload is just, is just so... I'm not capable of dealing with it. So, you know, I have to pull myself back from not knowing everything, <laughs> you know? Um, I'm shamelessly uninformed probably about a lot of things because I just don't have the bandwidth to take everything in. So I think that's part of self-care is pulling back and having boundaries around information and trusting that perhaps I already know, or if I don't know that I'll be guided uh, in my spiritual path to what I need to know. But, you know, I think, you know, Toffler is so right. And I read him back in the day. Um, we, you know, we just, we just become dehumanized with information overload. And I want to keep my humanity. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, you know, in this regard, uh, David Stoney is making a comment referring back again to the initiation uh, uh, issue that indigenous initiations had a context well established in the living history of the tribe or the clan. Because of our abysmal ignorance of our past, most of us don't realize that our species has gone through many previous extinction threatening times associated with the earth's cycling climate. Such times can be seen as initiations that have made us human. In the light of the ongoing extinction threatening uh, event of our own making can be seen as an initiation. That we've been here before. Oh, absolutely. And, um, you know, that's worth commenting on, uh, I think, Carolyn, if one thinks of, you know, deep in the collective memory all over the world is that there was a flood. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, one thinks of, you know, the, the mythologies around Atlantis, um, right. that, uh, you know, once or twice or several times, humanity uh, has uh, gone through the eye of the needle and somehow uh, come out the other side. There was a time when um, the uh, species was down to 70,000 uh, mating pairs. Wow. And yet we made it through and came out uh, the other side. Um, and I think that's, that's worth um, uh, pausing on as we begin to draw the session to a close. As you know history, as you know um, the temper of our times, um, how human beings have um, gone through the eye of the needle before, what virtues or what practices would you offer to us today of particular salience and importance uh, to empowering all of us during this dark time? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, there's the both and here, which is that we have that ancient memory. And also we've never gone through anything like this before, you know, in, in real time. And so we're holding both of those. You know, we have the capacity, we have the, you know, our species has endured or gone through um, and come back. And at the same time, um, many, many, many human lives are likely to be lost in the next extinction. Although, as Andrew and I talk about in radical regeneration, 
we don't see that as just a purely black and white event. Um, we see the uncertainty and we say, okay, there's also the quantum physics, a perspective of possibility that um, extinction may not look exactly as we think it, it, it will. Um, in other words, what if uh, a number of our species and other species are made extinct? Might there be pockets of survivors? We don't know. But what if there were pockets of survivors, little pockets here and there? Uh, number one, how would they be changed by what they've gone through? And what kind of humans might they become as a result of their surviving all of this? And what might that mean for the regeneration of the human race? We don't know, but we're not taking a, a black and white approach on extinction. And what we're saying is, what would you rather serve? Would you rather serve, we're all going to go extinct and it's going to be by a certain time and there's not going to be any humans left? Or would you like to serve the possibility that a new human being, a new kind of human being is being created through this initiatory process? The outcome being less important than the process. Yes, yes. Um, uh, very good point. Um, and uh, David uh, Stoney is just adding a comment, which I think is worth uh, noting and, and uh, reflecting on. He says that one of the major factors that has gotten us to the chaos of today is the fact that we have really been mimicking nature. Really? Yes. Just like any other animal that has procreative capacities, um, uh, open-ended desire and has unlimited food supply, we have continuously increased our popular population during this interglacial phase of Earth's cycling climate. Perhaps after the dark, unique species initiation process that may be just beginning, we can find a way to stop doing that. Whatever the case, as Carolyn uh, has said, emotional and spiritual endurance will be required. Um, that's worth just noting that as a species, like any species, we've spilled out as long as the environment can kind of contain us. Uh, and whether that's a, a bear species in the Rocky Mountain or, you know, a fish species, species tend to spawn and increase until something stops them. And then once that's stopped, then the challenge of survival uh, takes place. And it's worth noting uh, David Suzuki's um, statistic that in the history of a life on planet Earth, 95% of all the species that have arisen are now extinct. So going through this eye of the needle is not a foregone conclusion and requires on the part of every species uh, certainly the human species, a dexterity and a resilience uh, at the spiritual and emotional level in our case that enables us to navigate through the churning waters and the crashing rocks uh, to get through to the other side. Absolutely. And, you know, uh, there's the, the, the book Limits to Growth. And there's the research of Al Bartlett, who was at the University of Colorado for a number of years. He wrote an incredible book called Overshoot. And so, you know, nature has certain limits and we have not been willing to live within those limits. And when you don't live within nature's limits, there are consequences. Yeah. Like mm -hmm. the eye of the needle. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. And um, well, thank you, uh, Carolyn. It's comforting in some ways to know that we have been here before, mm -hmm. that our species has risen and fallen and gone through unimaginable climactic, political, social, economic turbulence uh, until we're down last count and somehow we've been able to 
rise again and persevere. And now we find ourselves on the brink of extinction yet again. And we're having to uh, take up the challenge, uh, I believe, as Carolyn has noted, to understand this as an initiation. And if we understand the context, that's what helps us shape the content into something that can transform our souls, our hearts, our relationships, uh, our lives, and thereby our capacity to survive uh, with the elegance uh, that I think is, is inherent uh, in our species. Um, so I wanna thank you for uh, guiding us in the way that you have. Uh, you're a very wise woman, Carolyn. It's, uh, it's been an honor uh, to be with you. Just remember that a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. <laughs> that it so thank you, everyone. And thank you, Carolyn. I, uh, I, uh, I've loved this session. Uh, you brought wisdom and, and deep insight uh, for which we are all grateful. Thank you for having me. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you tomorrow. Uh, same time, same station, 5 o'clock p.m. Central European time uh, here on Zoom. Bye, everyone. Thank you, Carolyn. Bye.